Hello everybody and welcome to this masterclass for the Swiss Federation. This is the online program for, of the Swiss Federation and we are here again for our 10th time here with a very special guest tonight and this is why this masterclass is going to be held in English. I'm really glad to welcome Grandmaster Peter Swiedler with us. Uh, Peter, hello. Uh, good evening, Bonsoir, and uh, guten Abend. <laughs> I'm, yeah, you're that's the extent of my that's the extent of my other languages. Okay, yeah. Bonsoir à tous. I'll say a few words in French and German as well. Bonsoir à tous et bienvenue à cette dixième masterclass dans le cadre du programme en ligne de la Fédération Suisse des échecs. J'ai le grand plaisir et l'honneur de recevoir ce soir comme invité spécial le grand maître Peter Swidler, qui vous a salué aussi en français à l'instant. Uh, meine Damen und Herren, willkommen uh, zu diesem zehnten Masterclass im Rahmen des Online-Programms des Schweizerischen Schachbunds. Uh, heute haben wir das große Glück, die große Ehre, uh, Großmeister Peter Swidler uh, willkommen zu heißen. Das ist unser fünfter Gast bei diesen Masterclasses mit einem speziellen Ehrengast. Und ich gehe zurück zum Englisch. Back to English. Um, Peter, I will introduce you shortly, I mean shortly, as short as it can be, because your record as a, as a chess champion is just unbelievable. So I'll try to focus on the main things. Uh, you are 44 years old, you were born in Leningrad, Soviet Union at the time. Nowadays it's called St. Petersburg and you still live there. Yeah, in I moved uh, about 10 meters from where I was born. Really? In, okay. in my 44 years, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a very stable person in that respect. <laughs> Great. And um, yeah, you've, you've actually um, stood out quite early in your youth as a, as a very gifted chess player. And um, you became grandmaster at the age of about 18. Uh, and this year, 1994, was quite important for you because uh, you also scored your first title of uh, Russian champion all categories, of course. Um, this, is, this was the first of eight titles of uh, Russian champion, an impressive record, I think, unequaled in, uh, in, uh, in the whole Soviet Union back then and, and I, Russia. I, I think I'm even beating the Soviet Union records by this yeah. point, although I, I never actually checked because I felt like it's, it's, you know, I was interested in doing as well as I can and not mm -hmm. in, let's say, beating but Winnings or Petrosian's records, it, it was a secondary concern, mm -hmm. very distant secondary concern. Yes, but you still have some, some years to go, of course, with possibilities to increase this, uh, this number. Uh, the last title you, you gained in 2017. And uh, going back in time after this uh, very strong year, 1994, I mean, every, every year was basically um, uh, strong uh, at the time because you, you steadily progressed and um, paved your way to, to the top of the world. But 1997 uh, was also pretty important because you scored your first international uh, victory, let's say, at the very top. Uh, that was in Tilburg when uh, you actually yeah. uh, finished first equal with Kasparov and Kramnik, but you had the better uh, tie break and you even beat uh, the world champion Gary Kasparov in that tournament. Um, 97 was also when uh, you, I think you first played in Switzerland at least, you, you, went, you came to, to Lucerne for the yeah. world team I, championship. Yeah, that, that tournament, that, that tournament was fun. Yeah, yeah, Russia, Russia won the title and you, you scored the gold medal on board two. Um, as far as I remember, the, the race for the title at the end in the last round was very, very close yeah, that, with the United States. There was States. a very dramatic, dramatic tournament and there was some, some fallout afterwards. I don't know how much time we, like, I could tell stories about that, but it's probably not that important. No, no, I also remember some people in the US team uh, being a bit uh, uh, nervous about them not winning. But uh, all right, and speaking of Switzerland, you've also been very successful in Biel. You won the, the Grandmaster Tournament in 2000. You finished second in 2001. And you've, came, you've come to Biel several times after that as well. Uh, and I think you've enjoyed uh, the stay at this uh, 
in this yeah, particular I've, I've, I, I like Bill. I've, uh, I've always, uh, like my first instinct always is to say yes when I get invited to Bill. I think I maybe said no once or twice due to other commitments, but in general I've, I'm, I'm always very happy to accept that invitation because uh, I think chess players get treated very well there and uh, Switzerland in general is a very uh, nice, uh, calm place to visit where you can just enjoy uh, playing chess uh, in a very comfortable setting, at least for me. Mm -hmm. Well, the record of, of uh, tournament wins, I mean, goes on and on, but let's, let's focus perhaps on the world championship and, and the highest title and, and also running for, uh, for the world championship. You've, uh, you've, uh, been, you've been part of the cycle in candidates in World Cup, uh, back then as well in the knockout world championship organized at the start of the, well, let's say at the end of the 90s and beginning of the, of the years 2000. Um, you've reached the semis, the semi-final in the, in the knockout world championship 2001-2002 when uh, you got uh, knocked out by Ponomaryov, uh, who eventually won the tournament. Mm -hmm. You've also uh, done pretty well, This, let's say, in the knockout system speaking of knockout system you've done really well in world cup as well uh, you've won the world cup in 2011 you've come very close uh, to winning it again in 2015 and um, and basically you've always during more than a dec decade you've been uh, uh, participating in uh, candidates and the cycles you've um, you finished second equal in San Luis 2005. This was a world championship organized in a closed tournament. It was won by Topolov. You finished second equal with a Vishienand, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And uh, also in the candidates in London 2013, I remember your, uh, your preparation for the tournament, not just chess-wise, but generally was extremely uh, professional, extremely high. And you finished uh, third in that candidates. Um, in, with a dramatic last round win against Magnus Carlsen, who ev eventually, despite losing to you, uh, won the event and qualified uh, to the final, which uh, made him become world, the world champion. And you've also finished fourth in the candidates 2016. So basically, um, you've been at the top during two decades, and um, I'm really looking forward to hearing you speaking about these experiences um, how much tension there is, uh, how much mental uh, drain and strength is required to, uh, to perform at the, at the very top. But this will be perhaps for the second part of uh, our masterclass because I would like to, to start um, basically by, by asking you the traditional question, how did you come to chess? Uh, yeah, that, that story is uh, um, a very usual one, I think, in particular, if we, if we t to talk about uh, the, the Soviet kids. Um, because uh, I caught the very end of the, uh, the Soviet Union. I was, I was born uh, in 76 and, uh, well, not the very end, obviously, 76 was very much, uh, very much still the... Uh, not the heyday, but uh, Soviet Union was still very much uh, unchanged then. But when I went to school, that was almost the beginning of Perestroika and, you know, dramatic changes to the country, which started happening around that time. Uh, and in my class in, in school, not in chess school, but in actual school, by third grade, I think, out of the boys and... Uh, Outside of, I think, specifically Georgia, it was mainly about the boys. Uh, I think three quarters of the boys in my class tried chess, mm -hmm. semi, like not professionally, but they went to, they went to a club and they were coached. And of course, by the third grade, everybody quit, <laughs> and I was the only one left, mm -hmm. uh, because clearly it's not for everybody. It's not a game that will, you know, you, you are not guaranteed if you try learning it to actually learn it. Uh, but the approach in those years was very obvious. Uh, the game was very much part of uh, part of the conversation about how to bring up your children. Mm -hmm. And parents would generally show the game to uh, to their kids, in particular to their boys, less so uh, less so with the girls. 
uh, and that's obviously a whole other topic which we probably <laughs> shouldn't be shouldn't be discussing because there are really no answers there. Mm -hmm. uh, and my father showed me the game when I was about six. Uh, I remember it was summer before I had to go to school, uh, so I was uh, six and a bit. And uh, as somebody who is now a father of two of two uh, children myself, I have to say uh, I I envy my parents uh, immensely because basically from the moment my dad showed me the pieces and showed me how they move, uh, they did not have to think about what to do with me anymore. <laughs> uh, because you, you, you literally couldn't drag me away from the board. I more or less instantly became absolutely obsessed with the game. And, uh, and obviously my parents who were always very, very supportive and they were always there for me in, in, in all things, they wouldn't, you know, dream of, uh, keeping me away from something that was clearly, uh, very important to me. Uh, so uh, for them, the decision when I turned seven and, uh, no, no, I didn't turn seven, but like when, when September arrived and uh, it was time for me to go to school, you could also apply, uh, to go, they were, they were called pioneers houses in those days. Uh, so, uh, in September you could go and, uh, uh, get your kids into pioneers houses according to their interests. So they did that as well, apart from the normal school. And that's basically how uh, a lot of careers in, in, in the Soviet years happened. Uh, you went through, uh, through the system, so to speak. You, you went to your local district pioneer house, and there you would be coached by somebody who is not a great chess player normally, but who instills in you some kind of love for the game. I think that was the, like, the major point of you going there, was not really to learn openings or you know, become a tremendously technically proficient player or anything like that. Uh, your goal there was to uh, get acquainted with the basics and also hopefully to um, to really see if, if you like the game enough. Mm -hmm. And my first coach, uh, he was excellent in that respect. He was uh, definitely not the greatest theoretician in the world. And in fact, uh, I had to in later years, I sort of had to uh, redo all of my, you know, openings uh, because what he taught me to play was really not that great and had to be basically forgotten <laughs> for me to start progressing past a certain point. Uh, but he was fantastic in terms of uh, creating enthusiasm for his subject. Uh, mm -hmm. And... Uh, because of him, I was I was very much uh, very much always in love with the game. I mean, I probably would have been in love with the game anyway, but he he also helped a great deal in that respect. And uh, in in my case, it was a reasonably uh, smooth progression from uh, from there because, uh, as you mentioned, I I showed promise from from reasonably early on. In fact, like I don't remember that actually, but. My parents told me a story of how uh, they took me to the Pioneer's house. And in that particular Pioneer's house, there were two uh, chess clubs, one for absolute beginners and one for people who are uh, somewhat more promising. And at first, because basically I, I was completely homeschooled, I knew nothing about the game officially. Uh, they took me to the one which was sort of simpler and for uh, children who were just beginning. And while they were talking to the woman who was running that club, uh, she told me to play one of her pupils. Uh, and in the time they had that conversation, I won my match against the, that pupil, like 2-1 or something. Mm -hmm. And she looked at the results, she looked at the games, and she said, yeah, you, you don't waste time, just go upstairs and <laughs> <laughs> apply to the second one. <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah, I think uh, for me there was never really... Uh, any kind of a particular doubt that this is what I was uh, what I was uh, planning to do with my life. Uh, mm -hmm. I always felt like chess will be uh, my uh, my my life's work, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And 
you can sort of argue exactly when I decided I will become a professional and how do you even describe a professional is a question. But um, for me, there was it was always kind of obvious that this is what I will be doing. Uh, so in that respect, I think I, I was extremely lucky uh, because I, I never really had any of those, you know, horrible moments of doubt Mm -hmm. And I never really had to question what what I wanted to do when I grew up, so to speak. So um, in these years, you also, of course, you went to this chess club and you had trainers, but you also worked a great deal at home since, as you mentioned, you were passionate about the game. Well, sort of, it depends on what you describe as work, because my relationship with work in general is kind of tricky. I I'm definitely not the most... Uh, diligent worker in the history of chess. I can say this very confidently. Mm -hmm. But for instance, I I read everything that we could find for me to read. My parents at some point, uh, you know, that, that period of me being interested in chess coincided with uh, uh, a lot of people emigrating from the country because the country was becoming more open and mm -hmm. uh, there was definitely a second wave of second wave of immigration happening exactly in those years, which as one of the outcomes, obviously not the most important one, but the, the most relevant one for this discussion was a lot of people were leaving who had very good chess libraries. Mm -hmm. And they obviously did not want to take, I don't know, 200 kilograms of, of books with them. Uh, so some libraries were, suddenly went on sale Mm -hmm. And my parents bought, I think, maybe two and a half full chess libraries. <laughs> uh, and I don't know how much structural work I did when I was a kid, but, but I definitely read basically all my spare time was spent uh, reading chess books. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think when you're young, this definitely counts as chess work. Of course. Because yeah. your brain, when you're young, it... It absorbs absolutely everything, and you know some of it is more important, some of it is less important. You know, some of it will will stay with you. Some of it, if you actually become a strong chess player, will have to be discarded as kind of useless baggage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you still you still absorb new information and you process process it, and it it makes you think about chess all the time. And I was doing I was I was doing it constantly, like. I would come back from school, I would drop my things on the floor, and I would just sit on the floor and, and read a chess book. <laughs> and and then my, my parents would tell me, you know, lunch, and I would get up and go with lunch, and then I would sit back down and read a chess book. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that was my day pretty much every day. So, so um, are you saying you were basically studying in blindfold without a chess board? That was never really, I understand it sounds uh, you know, if we're using, uh, if you're using, you know, the more fashionable psychological terms, I think this is called survivor bias. Mm -hmm. uh, a, something that I managed to do uh, now, because I managed to do it, seems to me like it's the easiest thing in the world. But for me, this particular aspect was never really a problem. I, mm -hmm. uh, I could visualize the board without any issues. I didn't really need to uh, to have the board in front of me from a reasonably early age, pretty much as, as far as as far back as I can remember. I uh, I could uh, I could uh, process the board and I didn't really need much in terms of, uh, you know, physical pieces. Mm -hmm. Well, I was asking this because um, I've played in several tournaments, same tournaments as you, and I've of often watched you, you would walk around quite often when when it's not your move and and of course we can i could feel that you were obviously completely absorbed in the game and thinking about the game and well sometimes taking a look at other not 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 games. not 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 100 percent of the time yeah, yeah but but even but when i but even when i sit at the board i very mm -hmm. often will not look at the pieces like i i think my preferred mm -hmm. way of sitting at the board would be uh sort of uh, like this yeah mm -hmm. uh <laughs> because uh the uh, the uh, for me the pieces actually kind of get in the way. Mm -hmm. uh, my eyes get tired, and uh, 
I don't like staring at the pieces for like half an hour at the time. Mm -hmm. Sure. Can you actually recommend this uh, way of, of training, of working to, to young players who also love the game? I mean, we don't have to force yourself. I mean, if, if you don't like it, you don't have to force yourself. But if you like chess and if you are capable of, of uh, analyzing blindfold, would you recommend that to, to younger uh, players or maybe not not just young yeah, this is a kind of a, this is a kind of a question and in general uh, I just wanted now that you know this is the first opportunity for me to say this so I will use it to say this mm. is I'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity to uh, to speak to uh, to your audience but I feel uh, uh, a little bit weird uh, in particular because of the topic because uh, throughout my career I was at some point I actually I don't exactly remember what forced me to think about this, but at some point I actually invested some time in thinking about this and I realized if there is something that you can say about me as a chess player in general terms, it's that I am an extremely strong practical player. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this describes me the best. If you want to like make a general, general statement about what kind of a chess player I am, I am a very, very talented practical player. But what that means for the purposes of this conversation is uh, I don't generally have any good answers because things that work for me, they work specifically for me. And uh, I don't really know and I've never tried to formalize whether you know, this is something that would be good for everybody or whether this is something that is very specific to uh, how I operate. And if you, the question you asked me about studying blindfold, I think I'm reasonably safe saying you should at least try it. Mm -hmm. Because I think it will tell you kind of early on a few things about how you process chess and what comes easy for you, what comes more with more difficulty uh because i think uh being able to visualize the board being able to calculate reasonably far and reasonably cleanly without seeing the board uh is an incredibly uh important uh, facet of of any strong players for arsenal mm -hmm. uh but Conversely, I, I, I'm not going to say that if you can't do it at an early age, something is wrong with you and you have to quit chess. That obviously is completely nonsense. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's a useful tool. It's, and it's something, obviously, you shouldn't be trying it from your first day with the game. But after you have gotten to a certain level, mm -hmm. uh, I think at least checking how difficult it is for you to to process information without the help of the board and pieces uh, is is going to tell you something that you probably might be interested to know. Sure. In any case, those master classes are there. I mean, with great people, great chess players as you and the ones we had before you are definitely great inspiration for, for everybody, for youngsters, but also less young people. So. Uh, even if um, even if a solution works well for you and maybe not for others, it's it's great for people to hear what uh, what you have gone through, what what has worked for you, and of course they can they can also. Yeah, I just I just wanted to very early on to say mm -hmm. that uh, I've never actually uh, one of the reasons I've never written a book on chess, for instance, is that. Uh, I feel like writing some kind of a lazy, my best 50 games or whatever type book is possible, but not that interesting. And writing a book that will teach others something about chess, something about how to approach chess as a game, requires a level of deeper understanding of the game, which I honestly, uh, I am not entirely sure I, I have. <laughs> Uh, or at least I'm not entirely sure I can put what I know about the games into words. Uh, so I think the, the spoken genre, what we're doing right now, is actually a lot more comfortable for me. And I feel like uh, by, uh, by trying to describe my experiences and perhaps showing something on the board that will also relate to how I, how I uh, approach chess, this is maybe the, uh, the preferred way of doing these things for me. But... 
uh, yeah, I I think I'm I'm much more of a player of chess rather mm -hmm. than a you know a theoretician of chess well, or a really phil those... philosopher of chess if you if you can call it that. Sure, those two categories. Uh, like me, the practical player and let's say the scientist or analyst. I mm -hmm. mean, this has always been. Uh, more or less uh, clear, clearly defined. I mean, in the in the, in the history of chess. I mean, yeah, I think instance, you can find Bogdanik. examples, and you you, yeah. you instinctively know who is who, right? Yeah, yeah, clearly. I mean, and uh, I'd like I'd also like to um, take this opportunity to um, to say people because I always forget it. I mean, people who are watching us are, are really uh, welcome, even encouraged to to uh, ask questions in the chat. Uh, I think Peter, you have uh, the second screen. So yeah, you can yeah. Check the chat if, as well. if, if you see me looking to the side, it's me. Yeah. It's me looking uh, looking at uh, at the stream on on the second screen. So I'm 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 paying some attention to that, and so if I see something there that needs to be addressed, I will I will answer questions from from sure. chat as well. Sure. And um, yeah, I also forgot to say in, in the introduction that that you also. Um, um, a keen commentator, streamer in these past uh, few months as well. So you have a lot of experience as well explaining things or what you see or at the board during uh, live games. Uh, also very, of course, very popular, uh, especially since I think you're the most fluent of all chess players in English as well, clearly. Uh, and uh, well, Probably some, and some native speakers will disagree, but... <laughs> native uh, English speakers, you mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, among among Russian players, at least you're clearly the best. Yeah. Okay. Among season. Russians, I think I think my my position is reasonably secure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And probably <laughs> for many years to come. In, in any case, um, in any case, let's let's move on. And um, well, perhaps. Okay. You, you were um, you had this this passion of, for chess, for reading, devouring chess books, also. But at some point in your young career. You you got let's say help from trainers um, mm -hmm. as as we know it the, the, the famous Soviet chess school, um, however legendary it may be. I mean it has some basics as well. And and can you tell us a little bit about how how these trainers or this trainer maybe you had not not too many. I don't know. Yeah, uh, I, I, I had basically you. two uh, two coaches in in my entire life who who qualify as a, as an actual coach. The one I I spoke about earlier, the one who uh, worked with me from the, the the moment I arrived at the doorstep of of my pioneer house when I was seven, and I think we parted ways when I was uh, sixteen. Mm -hmm. uh, officially, we kind of stopped working together when I was between I think fourteen and fifteen because he went to Moscow. Uh, because in those years, and this being Soviet Union, still sort of Soviet Union in ideologically. Uh, mm -hmm coaches needed to get certificates and he wanted to get a better certificate so that he could get sort of better jobs and you still needed to kind of improve your qualification. So he went to Moscow to study at some kind of a academy for teachers and coaches and trainers and basically left me at home to, to fend for myself. And I had to rebuild my repertoire. Basically, I think between 14 and 15, I switched from playing 1d4 on move one and playing uh, openings, which were working fine for me at the, on a junior level because I was, once again, I, I, could, I can try to be modest, but I was basically better than most of the people I was playing against. Not everybody, but most of the people I was playing against, I was clearly better than them. So it didn't really matter which openings I played. Mm -hmm. uh, but then at somewhere around that age, I started playing in tournaments where uh, people were just much stronger than my previous level. And my openings were just not good enough anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had to rebuild my repertoire from basically I became a 1e4 player over the course of maybe one year, basically on my own, by mm -hmm. reading uh, reading magazines, studying games of other people. My, my parents got me some coaching, <clears throat> sort of occasional lessons with uh, uh, people in St. Petersburg, but it wasn't anything uh, systematic. Uh, and then uh, at some point officially, we agreed that we have to uh, go our separate ways with my first coach. And then in 93, uh, I got picked up by uh, uh, somebody who I think 
played an absolutely unbelievable uh, role in me becoming who I eventually became as a chess player. Uh, I started working with an international master from St. Petersburg. Uh, his name is Andrei Lukin, who is really not well known at all in, in the West. But uh, now that I have this uh, pl platform, if I could spend like 30 seconds telling you a story about his life, mm -hmm. uh, just to uh, give you an impression of what life for a chess sure. player was in Soviet Union. Uh, I believe in 19, I keep on mixing things up. Uh, I think it was 67. Uh, he won a junior tournament, which was a qualification for the under-20 world championship. And in those years, basically, the under-20 world championship was just about the only way for a promising young player from Soviet Union uh, to get some invitations, because there were too many players and really not enough invitations. So if you became the world champion, uh, first of all, this probably already uh, gave you a grandmaster title because I think it was written into the regulations of the tournament that the world champion for that year in under 20. And in those years, it was only under 20. There were no other age categories. Uh, so it would give you a title and it also gave you some invitations to play in, in, in the tournaments outside of the uh, Soviet Union. And he won that qualification uh, ahead of people like Karpov and Balashov and uh, some others who perhaps are less famous, but were extremely strong at the time. Uh, but the world under 20 that year was supposed to be held in Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the uh, Six Day War happened. Oh, yeah. And uh, Soviet Union just completely severed all diplomatic ties with Israel. Uh, so he just couldn't go. And, and that was his one opportunity completely gone. And in the end, he didn't even become a grandmaster. But for instance, he won the, uh, the Leningrad championship, I think, six times. And the Leningrad city championship was, I think, in strength, equal to, you know, your average Central European national championship. Mm -hmm. Normally, like, seven grandmasters would play in it. Uh, and yeah, he is, he is a very, very good chess player. And also, uh, because his own career kind of stalled, he went into coaching and he coached, uh, before me, he coached Konstantin Sakaev, who, mm -hmm. uh, became world junior champion, I think at some point and became a very strong grandmaster. Then he worked with me. And then he worked, uh, more recently, he worked with Kirill Alexeyenko, who is now, uh, playing in the candidates, and I'm actually helping him. So that was a very nice kind mm -hmm. of a generational thing, you know. One pupil of Lukin helping another pupil of Lukin in in the candidates is is something that was very uh, very pleasing to me because I I really treasure what he's done to me, and uh, we're still in touch. And uh, you know, I maybe I'm overusing the word love, but I I, I do I do love him dearly for. Uh, he is a very nice human being as well, and just just uh, wanted to say, uh, you know, spend a minute thing uh, saying thank you to him. Mm -hmm. Very. Yeah. And how how what exactly? Met, let's say not not too concretely, but basically, how did he uh, work with you? What 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 did he? Well, he fill in gaps he was. Uh, he, he started working on my uh, on my openings. I, I think these days, unfortunately, most of the work you do will be, I don't know if I, why I say unfortunately, it's just a fact of life, but most of the work you do uh, will be uh, work on openings. And even in the mid 90s, it was still true. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did something to make my opening repertoire much more solid. Uh, he basically taught me how to play Grunfeld, uh, which is, uh, which has become, um, you know, my, my absolute main weapon and remains my absolute main opening with the mm -hmm. black pieces against 1d4. And he also made me uh, a lot more serious about chess in general because, uh, I mean, I obviously loved the game and I was very uh, enthusiastic about the game, but my approach wasn't, wasn't really very systematic, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and... When he when he picked me up as a as a pupil, I was an uh, an international master. But I became an international master, I think, in '91, 
And from 91 to 93, nothing much happened to me. Like I wasn't, I was kind of a solid, nothing special international master uh, with more, with a rating of about, I don't know, 2450, 2470, mm -hmm. which was better in those years than it is now, but still absolutely not sensational. Uh, and uh, I think we started working in 93. And then in 94, I basically got a grandmaster norm in every single tournament I played in. Mm -hmm. I won my first international open. I, I won... Uh, a few other things and then I sort of concluded the year by winning the world juniors under 18 and then the Russian championship mm -hmm. uh, so uh, That's that's a very nice picture, but from a slightly earlier era. I think that's probably around 89 mm -hmm. 90 that that kind of period uh, I think that was taken uh, when I was showing uh, a, a game to the other pupils of the Kasparov school, That's uh, that was uh, how the Kasparov school operated. You brought, uh, uh, you, you brought some games with you and then you would show it to the rest of the pupils and also there would be some coaching staff sitting there asking you questions and you were supposed to uh, show your evaluations and also defend them against, you know, criticism and, mm -hmm. and against other suggestions. And it was a, was a very uh, useful, useful tool for uh, for for the coaches to assess how how gifted the kids were, but also for the gift uh, for the kids to uh, to uh, learn through uh, you know discussion with people who who also loved the game but perhaps understood it better than they did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they were also you know you, you visited those chess schools as well. In uh, in Moscow, this Podvinik. Yeah, they were they were normally uh, normally in some Moscow suburbs. Mm -hmm. uh, I I caught the very last two sessions of the Batvinik uh, Kasparov School. Batvinik was no longer there mm -hmm. uh, because he was already quite old and didn't really have the energy to deal with uh, you know the young punks. Mm -hmm. And Kasparov would normally show up for like three or four days, look at our games, maybe give a simul if he wanted to, or not give a simul if he didn't. <laughs> Maybe play some football with the kids and then go uh, go his his own way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, and um, coming back to Lukin then and um, and the work and the Grunfeld, perhaps well we've we've talked uh, we've talked quite a, a great deal and uh, may, I'm sure um, our spectators will be and uh, delighted to to have an example of yours when uh, when you were young and I think you've prepared a, a Grunfeld game. Speaking of this, uh, yeah, I think uh, the first one, the first one we, we, we picked for this lecture, it was actually a unique suggestion, and I was very happy with it because I was not entirely sure what I'm supposed to show. And when uh, Yannick brought brought this game up, uh, it brought such nice memories that I thought, yeah, this this is probably where we should start. Well, this uh, was actually this is a, the, uh, a game which I which I have in my in my favorite Grunfeld games when from a long time already because I have played Grunfeld as well and um, and since I'm a trainer sometimes my pupils play the Grunfeld and I also say okay in this line you have to check that game uh, of Peter Swidler's because it's a real I mean you feel the spirit of the opening and, and from someone who yeah. who uh, masters the opening so go ahead mm -hmm. Peter. Yeah uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a very pleasant memory on very many levels because I think the game kind of stands up even now I for for this uh, this stream, I chose not to check anything with like modern supercomputers because I didn't really want to get upset mm -hmm. when it tells me that I've blundered something. So there might be some mistakes creeping in uh, when I show you lines which uh, I analyzed when I was annotating that game then. But I think in the spirit, at least, this game still holds up. I think it's mm -hmm. played like uh, it's a proper Grunfeld game, regardless of what uh, the the heartless machine might tell you about the positions. Well, I remember and, that uh, I, I checked it uh, some time ago with, for my pupils and it seemed all fine. I mean, I think white mm -hmm, can, yeah, can I, keep the balance at some point, just but nothing special. So, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the setting for this is, uh, this is from a World Under 18 championship in uh, Seged in, mm -hmm. uh, in Hungary, uh, which I ended up winning uh, with uh, I think I scored seven and a half out of nine. Uh, and that was, I think that was round seven, but I'm not entirely sure, six or seven. Uh, mm -hmm. I was doing fine, but I still needed to to play pretty much every game for a win because uh, 
uh, in, in a nine in a nine round Swiss with a lot of very strong players uh, playing, uh, you are never guaranteed um, uh, that you can coast and just play safely. Uh, and my opponent is uh, Georgi Kaciishvili, who uh, in those days was a promising youngster, and now I think he is a grandmaster. I think he lives in the States mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he, I'm pretty sure he played for Georgia in, in those years. Yeah, sure. Yeah, he did. Yeah, I remember. Um, yeah, very, uh, very dangerous, very uh, strong opponent in general. I outrated him by by about 100 points by that point, but I knew that uh, this is not going to be an easy game. Uh, so let's uh, let's start taking a look at what happened. Uh, so as announced, we we played a Grunfeld and uh, uh, Georgi played a line CD5 knight d5 bishop d2, uh, which uh, in those years I think I knew almost nothing about. This is a this is a very serious line these days, of course. One of the uh, I think you can make an argument to say that this is one of the I don't know top three non main line critical responses to the Grunfeld, together with uh, probably uh, uh, the the third of three. These days people also, of course, play h4, but in 1994, I think if you played h4, they would just disqualify you because they, you are clearly insane. Mm -hmm. uh, the, these days, uh, you know, a lot more things are allowed, which really weren't allowed then. Um, so knight c3, d5, cd5, knight d5, bishop d2. But I had some idea of what I'm supposed to be aiming for. So I played bishop g7, e4, knight b6, bishop e3. Here I castled. And once again, we could go into details about this position. I think the two main moves for white here, if you uh, if you look at modern practice, are h2, h3. And also somewhat curiously, bishop f1, b5, which is really not a move you can guess if you don't know because it feels very very strange to invite uh, both a6 or c6 and then actually go all the way back to e2 but it turns out that in many lines it's very useful for white to provoke a6 for instance but once again it's not really that important we're not here for a, a theoretical lecture and Georgi played bishop e2 which is I think in those years was supposed to be one of the main lines knight c6, and here you can still play knight f3 and it will be a normal game, but uh, instead he played d5, knight e5, bishop d4. And I'm pretty sure at this point I was completely on my own. I, it's not that I couldn't remember what I'm supposed to do, I just didn't know. Uh, but I, I by, by that point I developed, I think, a reasonably good feeling for how this opening is supposed to be played, and also uh, apart from what I already said, apart from me clearly being more, more of a practical player than anything else, uh, in those years in particular, I was very clearly a dynamic player and not a positional player. Uh, so for me, uh, any kind of ideas which were involving sacrifices for initiative were immediately appealing. And if we look at this position uh, more seriously, White obviously uh, played bishop d4, uh, to sidestep uh, ideas of like knight c4, because if you go f4 here, obviously knight c4 is uh, is very strong. Uh, therefore, by playing bishop d4, white is now actually threatening f2, f4, and that will be very unpleasant if I allow it. And I started thinking about how I can prevent this from happening, and I think reasonably quickly I settled on this idea of just giving up this pawn, uh, but forcing the white bishop away from the long diagonal. So I played c5, uh, Georgi took, and here I played knight e5, c4. And uh, by distracting his bishop from the long diagonal here, I'm creating a lot of play uh, uh, against the b2 pawn. In particular, if he goes queen b3 here, we can just take on b2. Uh, and if he recaptures this knight, there's this very beautiful shot, knight a4, using the pin uh, on the long diagonal, and black actually wins uh, a lot of material. This is completely unplayable for white. Queen takes b2, of course, is not forced, but black is doing quite quite okay here. And somewhat surprisingly, the same applies even if he does it uh, with the trade on c4 first. This is what he played. He took on c4 and played queen b3. And seems like my initiative is about to run out because the knight has to retreat, and then white will eventually develop the knight, I guess, here or here. 
uh, castle short. And if Bled doesn't do, doesn't do something very quickly here, uh, he will uh, not really have any any kind of serious compensation. But when I was playing c5, I already saw that I can still take on b2 in this position. Uh, because after queen takes b2, queen c7, it turns out that because of all of my uh, pressure along the uh, c-file and along diagonal, white cannot actually uh, keep, the, uh, keep the extra piece. Uh, and uh, if he plays queen a3, we can go b6, uh, bishop b4, and a5, and uh, everything starts collapsing. Uh, which I think means that what, what Georgi played is correct here. He played bishop before, I played a5, now uh, I do win uh, one of the pieces back, he goes knight g2, takes, takes, and we arrive at this position, which um, looks reasonable for black, but you still need to uh, think about what you want from the game here, because you cannot really stop white from castling, and if you allow white to, let's say, castle and then play, I don't know, rook fc1, rook ab1, black is still a full pawn down. And uh, yes, you do have uh, the two bishops against the two knights, but the bishops aren't doing uh, very much yet. Uh, it's really not that clear how you're going to make any progress. And I suspect if you play slowly here, if you, if you, don't, if you don't generate enough counterplay straight away, uh, your position will be quite unpleasant. But I was very happy with the decision I took here. I remember I was quite proud of this maneuver. I played bishop g4, another move which looks a little bit strange because uh, f3 is possible. Of course, I'm creating a threat of bishop takes e2 and then the pin will start working. But f3 is very much possible. Uh, and normally you don't want uh, to give white uh, additional tempi. But now the bishop drops back to d7, white castles, and here I played b7, b5. And the idea becomes much more obvious. By forcing f3, we have created uh, an additional source of counterplay by opening uh, the uh, a7, g1 diagonal, and just generally softening up uh, the white king's side. Uh, and somewhere around here, I felt uh, that probably I'm at least fine, and maybe I can even play for a win. But I have a feeling that my opponent wasn't wasn't sure yet what's going on, and uh, I think also because it's a Swiss and you are supposed to uh, to play every game for a win with the white pieces, maybe he played for a win for a little bit longer than he should have, because I think if he goes let's say rook a b one here, and I play rook f c eight and he trades uh, the pawn on b five for the pawn on a two, I still feel that the activity of my pieces and the the relative safety of the kings because the king on g8 is sorry the, the king on g8 is completely safe and the king on g1 because he might play the f3 isn't really uh that great i think black has perfect compensation for the pawn but maybe not more than that uh instead uh my opponent played uh king h1 which looks like a logical move. I was I kept on saying that you know uh, queen b6 check and all that has to be calculated on every move. So it makes seemingly it makes sense for white to just sidestep that type of counterplay straight away and not have to think about it again. Uh, but unfortunately for my opponent, uh, after the move uh, queen d6, which I think maybe he underestimated, uh, he now has well, quite serious problems because it turns out that. I probably, in most cases, uh, shift the queen away from b4. And if I, if I actually manage to play b5 before here and drive away one of these knights from this very nice uh, connected setup with one knight on e2 and the other one on c3, the white position actually starts to crumble. And from that moment on, I think Georgi never really felt uh, like he had any control over the proceedings. Uh, he played... Queen takes d6. If you go rook a b1 here, we take, take, we play rook fc8, and white probably has to take on b5. Uh, and in this position, uh, the second rook is about to come into c2, and maybe white holds, but it's not going to be uh, it's not going to be very pleasant for him to deal with the with the threats of I don't know. Let's say bishop comes to d4, uh, second rook comes into c2, and only black I think is playing for a win here. Uh, but maybe it was better than what he did, because after queen d6, e d6, rook a b1, rook f b8, rook b4, rook a3, uh, it turns out that it's just very, very difficult for white 
uh, to keep his pieces uh, safe. Uh, if he goes uh, rook c1, rook c8, uh, things are uh, going quite uh, quite bad for him. This is what happened in the game. And after rook b3, b4, uh, the position is also kind of bad because uh, you cannot really give up the pawn on a2 by removing by moving the knight. And if you do take on a3, uh, this rook lands on b2. And I think even uh, with, with the naked eye, so to speak, uh, it should be quite obvious that black is assuming complete control over the game. And uh, the game continued rook c1, rook c8. Another nice little tactical detail, because if you take on b5 here, uh, rook c1, knight c1, and now a very sudden move, rook a3, e3, just picks up the knight on c1, because there is no stopping uh, rook e1 check. Uh, so after rook c8, he had to play rook b3, I took... Uh, and played rook a8, and and now before happens next move, and white just runs out of uh, runs out of squares. Uh, there's really it's very very difficult to stop uh, what's going to happen. Uh, you you still shouldn't really completely collapse, which is what happened to to Georgi here. You can play uh, more precisely than he did, but uh, perhaps he was also I don't remember exactly, but I think he was probably also some uh, some pressure on the clock. And that uh, made his decisions uh, some optimal. So he played rook b1, uh, I guess intending to return the pawn with b4, knight a4. But I played rook a3 first, and now we are threatening to play b4. Uh, if the knight goes to a4, we will take it, and then the b-pawn will continue running. It's very important to get the rook to a3 first. Uh, he played uh, knight d1, rook a2, and... Uh, somewhere around here, you can see how uh, white is slowly but surely being deprived uh, of the squares. Uh, before is a very useful move just to give this diagonal to the second bishop. And uh, the knights uh, are really completely stuck where they are. Uh, after knight e3, bishop b5, black's initiative continues uh, kind of uh, unimpeded. And after knight d3, which is what uh, Georgi played, I played rook e2, of course, not allowing knight takes before because of rook e1 mate. Uh, he played g3, bishop b5, knight takes before, rook e1 check, king g2. And now the, the final uh, pieces are joining the attack. We are now creating a very obvious threat of bishop f1 mate. And despite being two pawns up, uh, the, the white king is... Uh, now being hunted, uh, hunted down, and uh, his position, I think, is completely indefensible. Uh, if you go to h3, uh, we can even do it with the quiet move h5, but it's also possible to just start giving checks, and eventually the king will probably get mated somewhere around these squares on g5 or f5, uh, which is why uh, in this position Georgi played knight c2 and uh, resigned after uh, rook e2 check. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know, like, now that you've seen me show a game, uh, I would like some feedback about whether I should be stopping more and whether the speed is a little bit too high, but uh, as Yannick knows, I've prepared quite a lot of material and <laughs> I'm trying to, uh, to make sure we get to see at least a little bit of it. <laughs> uh, but if we talk about this game in more general terms, I think uh, I remember feeling extremely proud about it when I played it because I thought... Uh, it's it's a game which showcases all the reasons why why I love the Grunfeld. Uh, sharp tactical fight for initiative in the opening, and then uh, also a facet of chess which uh, has uh, you know stayed with me throughout my career. I from a very early age, I really really loved playing with bishops against knights. And this game, I think in particular, start, starting from somewhere around here, it is just such a perfect uh, illustration of what two bishops can do to two knights mm -hmm. on an open board when the knights don't have good squares. Uh, and even now, uh, when I was showing you the game, I, I think I spotted some moments where I think white could have defended better. But... I am still very, very happy with the uh, like the, the key ideas and the key themes uh, that I managed to uh, to realize in this game. I think it's a 
it's a very decent Grenfell game, uh, even even 16 years later. No, of course, it's very, very impressive. Uh, I think the, the, the key move, which he, you said he maybe underestimated, maybe he overlooked this queen b6 on move 20, which is pretty unusual way to exchange queens in the... Exactly, in the yeah, I, I think it's easy to miss. Down. Sorry. Yeah, I, I, was, I was agreeing with you. I think uh, that was maybe the move I loved the most when I was playing the game, because I thought... Uh, it's much more natural, I think, originally to to think about this position in terms of, uh, you know, let's keep the queens, let's mm -hmm. try to generate some some play when the queens are still on because the king on h1 maybe is a little bit unsafe. But this specific transition into a pawn down endgame, uh, I remember I, I felt I felt it was it was a good decision, and I uh, in those years I think I was. Uh, how to say that? I was a lot easier to to convince I played well. Like these days, mm -hmm. I think it's very very difficult for me to convince myself that I played an actual good game. But well, in those years, I think maybe. I was, yeah, I think I was happier with myself a lot more than I am now. Is what I'm trying to say, mm -hmm. and I was very happy after this one. If I if I remember well, you had the same surprising queen d6 once, maybe in a World Cup against uh, Vadim Milov. If I, which also broke your was, victory. Uh, yeah, no, but that was slightly less striking because mm -hmm. I think I remember the game, but the, in in that position in the World Cup, right? I, I think so. I think yeah. I, I I think I won the first one, and mm -hmm. in the second one, yeah, it was an important game, but it wasn't. I mean, it was an important move in that game, but it wasn't the only move in the mm -hmm. position. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a, it's something that stays with you, and it's something that you later can remember, and it obviously. Uh, patterns like this are, uh, in particular, if they lead you to winning an important and a very pleasant game, such as this one, uh, they stay with you uh, much longer. Mm -hmm. So it looks like spectators are quite happy with the speed. Um, okay, yeah, I, I'm, so I'm also yeah, keeping, keeping an eye on the comments. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So let's move on uh, perhaps to another game of yours. Yeah, uh, so th that tournament finished with me uh, in, the, in the last round I played. I don't know how, how many of our viewers here uh, know the name of Josh Waitzkin. Mm -hmm. I think these days he is much more known as, a, as an author of uh, good books on uh, sort of motivational books, as far as I understand, more than anything. He has become, uh, I think, a, a Tai Chi professional. Yeah, I think he even won the world championship. Yeah, yeah he is. category of Tai Chi. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, in the last round, I played Josh with Black in that tournament, and mm -hmm. I only needed the draw, and he needed to beat me. And uh, it was a bit of a, a dramatic game, but I ended up winning it in the end. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that was obviously a very important tournament in my career because I that was my second uh, uh, World Juniors. I also played the under 16 in 92, and I finished. Uh, uh, Hang on a second. That was not what I wanted to do. That's what I wanted to do. Um, I finished uh, tied for first third with uh, Daniel Friedman and uh, Ronan Harzvi, and uh, Ronan was actually first on uh, on tie breaks, which was a decent result. But of course, I wanted I wanted more. Mm -hmm. yeah, in those years, I was quite ambitious, and uh, sharing first and not becoming first was actually kind of upsetting. I remember, but. In 94, I actually won the tournament, which uh, gave me a lot of confidence. And then the next two games, actually, I will, I will show you one snippet, the, the next game I have on the board. I, I'm not going to show the entire game, but mm -hmm. because this is a kind of a retrospective of my career, starting from a very early age and uh, going on, I wanted to tell you a little bit uh, about this game, because... Um, we had a little bit of conversation about that with uh, with Yannick because Yannick probably remembers. Uh, I think you you do remember Vasily, right? You you probably played yeah, this. I, I lost to, to him once, yeah, in two thousand one, yeah. I think. So yeah. Yeah. So know. when I said earlier uh, I, 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 in the stream, I said that when I was playing in junior tournaments, I was just generally better than most other people. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a correct statement, but I didn't say all the people, <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, Vasily was somebody I played in junior St. Petersburg tournaments uh, from, I think, the, fir the first game I ever played against him was w when we were eight. 
I lost that one and I lost, I think, the next three as well. Maybe not three, but definitely two. Uh, he was somebody who uh, very consistently would beat me in, in junior tournaments, finish above me in junior tournaments. I always had a very, very difficult time playing against him. And we were, I think, generally considered uh, two of the most gifted juniors of, of our age, age group, let's say, uh, born in, let's say, 76. Uh, it was normally me, him, and Vadim Zvegintsev, who also became a very, very strong grandmaster. And I think we were, our careers had a very similar kind of a curve until, it will sound extremely weird, but I want to say until this game. This game was played uh, in the Russian Championship uh, 1994, which was uh, the first uh, really strong Russian Championship. The, 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 Russia as a country, uh, you know, became a country in 92. So the, the championship was very young. And I think 92 and 93, there were almost no prizes, and therefore the field wasn't very strong. But in 94, uh, the first prize was a car. And uh, that brought a lot of strong players. It, like al already in 95, absolutely everybody played. But in 94, perhaps because it was held in Elista, and Elista is a place that not very many people knew in those years and not very many people, I think, were prepared to, uh, to go, especially if there are other tournaments you could play in. The field was much stronger than in previous years, but it wasn't the absolute top field. At that point, I was rated 25.50, and I think I was number eight in the tournament by rating, somewhere around there. And I, uh, you know, the story how I got there is also, like, if we talk about happy coincidences that happen in your career, uh, before the tournament, like, directly before the tournament, I played my first ever Tilburg. And in 94, Tilburg was a knockout. I won in the first round, and in the second round, I was playing against Alexander Khalifman, who was a childhood idol of mine. I absolutely loved him in those years. He was, he was this huge hero of mine. And I beat him with the white pieces in the first game. Mm -hmm. And then in the second game, I got destroyed, and I lost the rapid tie breaks. And if I somehow beat Halifman, I would just not have enough time to get to Elista. That round was the last round where I could lose and still get on the plane and be in Elista in time for the first round. Mm -hmm. So basically, that loss to Khalif uh, played an absolutely pivotal, positive role in my, in my chess career, which obviously, when I was losing to him, it didn't really feel all that pleasant. But <laughs> it turned out to be a very, very good thing. Uh, and in that, in that Russian championship, uh, both me and Vasily, we were doing quite well. And this game was played in round 10 out of 11. And I had half a point more than Vasily. And I played him with the black pieces. And I'm not going to show you the entire game, but I just wanted to show you the beginning. He played e4. And in those years, I played some Sicilians, but mainly I was playing the Spanish. But for some reason, against Vasily on that day, I decided to play some kind of a weird period slash modern. Uh, to which he replied, Bish P2, D5, Knight B, D2, which is actually a very clever little system against this. Uh, not, not stupid at all. Uh, I took, no, actually, I didn't take. I played Bishop G4 for some reason. He played C3. Uh, here, as my notes indicate, I should have taken and played something like E6. And my position is fine. But I was so nervous on that day for some reason that I took on e4 and then took on f3, which is also kind of stupid. And then I played knight d7, uh, intending to play knight g6 next. And then he played queen e2. And I realized I cannot play knight g6 because knight d6 check and knight takes b7 and I'm kind of lost. So I played queen c7 uh, to stop knight d6 check and he played g3. And now he, he's basically threatening to play bishop f4 and then knight d6 check and I will resign. Uh, so I looked at this position. I remember sitting there thinking, what have I done? Like I'm completely lost. It's move 10 and I've completely lost already. Uh, but 
you don't want to resign here. It looks a bit stupid to resign. And I, I, I sat there for like half an hour and I ended up convincing myself, I think correctly, that I have to play E5. Uh, and if you just look at this position, like I'm completely undeveloped, my king is on E8, and it will take me some time to get it to like either side, whichever way I want to hope to castle, it will be very difficult for me to get there. Uh, and also he has the two bishops. And basically I think we can stop here. I somehow managed not to lose that game. And then uh, in the last round, this is the, the game I will show you uh, in a moment. In the last round, I was playing against uh, uh, Andrei Sokolov, who uh, the French part of our audience, if there are some French viewers, will know quite well because he at some point moved to France and became very much a fixture on the French chess scene. Uh, and who was... Uh, in the mid-80s, was definitely, I think, chess player number three in the world after Karpov and Kasparov. In fact, when I think when I was maybe 11, I played in a simul against him in, in, in Leningrad. And uh, I beat him in that simul. I think he... Uh, it was a very strong simul. There were, like, candidate masters. And he lost, I think, four games out of 30. One to me, one to Gata, and two to other people who I don't quite remember now. Uh, but what I wanted to say is uh, I, I won, I didn't lose this game, and then I won the next game, became the Russian champion, and that kind of kick-started my career. But if, if the position that you see on the board, if Vasily actually converts this into a full point, it is he who probably plays Sokolov in the last round, and if he beats Sokolov in the last round, he becomes Russian champion in 1994. He gets invited into the Olympic team, and our careers basically become interchanged. And it's always been kind of darkly amusing to me that, because we're still very, very close with, uh, with Vasily. He is, he is a close friend of, uh, of mine and, uh, and, and, and my wife, and uh, we still uh, are very much in touch. Uh, but... You know, he became a mathematician, and he's an incredibly smart guy. But he, you can sort of trace it all back to this one position, mm -hmm. uh, which in some way, I think, very much defined how, I, how our careers uh, would continue. Uh, so I just wanted to show this brief snippet. And uh, from here, we get to that game that I mentioned uh, not the most, not the most uh, beautiful game I ever played, but uh, maybe one of the most important ones in my early career. This is the last round of uh, the Russian Championship uh, in 1994, where I was reasonably sure that if I win, uh, I probably uh, win the tournament, and the draw probably will not be enough. Uh, and uh, that game went... Uh, Andre was very much a Sicilian player, so he played uh, the usual uh, the usual Sicilian. This line of the Sicilian was quite fashionable in those years. Uh, and those days I played uh, this line against it, which is not really recommended, but it's something that I was very familiar with. Uh, e5, knight of three. Once again, I don't want to touch the opening very much. I just want to, to show you some pivotal moments of this game. Uh, I was aiming specifically for this position because we analyzed it. I remember we actually had this uh, on file, so to speak. Me, me and uh, uh, Lukin, we, we looked at this. It wasn't uh, just uh, uh, an improv over the board. Uh, so al already in those years, like some fruits of our cooperation were quite, quite clear from the, the opening results. 94, Queen D2. Uh, all of this gets exchanged. Bishop e6. Uh, Bishop e6 already is an interesting moment because uh, this is a, uh, a theme which uh, will dominate the early game here. This bishop quite clearly wants to be on c4. Uh, so black uh, will invest quite some energy into making sure that the bishop cannot get to c4 very comfortably. Therefore, for instance, not bishop e7 because then white would just jump at the opportunity to play bishop c4. Black starts with bishop e6. I castle, he goes bishop e7. Uh, here, uh, a very simple trick, but still a trick that uh, it's worth noting. If white goes e5 here, 
black can take with the knight and white cannot take in his turn because bishop g5 whoops arrows <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. uh, you see the point i still cannot draw, draw arrows to save my life somehow um and uh now, uh, therefore, we go knight d5, black castles, uh, white plays king b1, uh, and black plays rook c8. And in this position, I remember I was very happy with the following sequence, uh, because sort of the, the, the first development has finished, and you need to figure out uh, what, your, uh, what your plan is here uh, as white. And the move you most want to make, I think, in this position is... Bishop c4 once again to support the knight on the, to support the knight. Whoops, not a5. Sorry, support the knight on d5. In general, I think uh, putting it on b3 is quite useful here, just to uh, additionally safeguard your king uh, and also put some pressure, uh, perhaps in the center. The rook normally goes to f1, and then we can start thinking about some kind of a pawn storm on the king side. But the issue with bishop c4 is that black can play knight b4 here. Uh, attacking the bishop with the rook and forcing some simplifications. But you do want to start developing. And I thought for, for quite a long time here, and I settled on this idea that I can play uh, bishop e2, uh, connecting the rooks and just generally making a useful move. But more than anything else, we are saying to black, please make a move. And I think the most natural move for black in this position probably, I, 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 unless you think quite deeply about things, is the move queen a5, uh, which is a very normal way to develop your pieces in the Sicilian. You uh, you kind of hint that, you know, some kind of counterplay with knight b4, maybe not immediately, but in some future. I think it's very, very normal to make this move sort of on autopilot if you don't really think about things. And now I played bishop c4. And the point, of course, is... Uh, now that the queen has left the d8 square, uh, knight b4 will be impossible because the bishop on a7 will, uh, will fall. And in this way, we get to uh, transfer the bishop over to b3. And with the bishop on b3, uh, we will start uh, generating threats in the center as well. Uh, he played rook f8. I played bishop b3. Queen c5, rook d3. Uh, the rook is just usefully placed on d3. Sometimes maybe we can think about playing rook c3 in the future. We also want to maybe bring the second rook uh, to d1 and start just putting pressure on the uh, d6 pawn. Uh, so he played b5, rook h d1, knight a5. Uh, b5 is specifically needed, I think, in this position to have the option of meeting rook c3 with knight c4. Otherwise, uh, rook c3 would be just very, very strong. Uh, and in this position, I uh, play the uh, short tactical sequence, which actually wins the pawn on d6. Uh, we take on e7. Uh, takes, rook takes e6. This looks like a blunder, because black can take on b3, and now the pawn on c4 is, c2 is hanging. Uh, but white has rook d8 check, rook e8 takes, takes, and a b. Uh, and uh, white is better because, of course, white white has an extra pawn. But there is some counterplay uh, on the queen side, of course. And uh, as usual, the moment um, black loses his one weakness on d6, his remaining pieces are reasonably active. And from this moment, I just wanted to uh, to show you a sequence uh, later in the game because, as I mentioned, this is not maybe the most exciting game in the world. But there was a, a, a moment there which, once again, could have maybe changed my career quite a bit. Uh, h6, uh, rook d4, he played rook c8, I dropped the queen back to d2. Of course, we would like to play rook d8 checks next, uh, trading more pieces, which is why he goes king h7. And here, during the game, I remember I was very happy with the idea of playing b3, b4, and fixing the pawn on a7. But I think it was a mistake. Uh, I think it wasn't really necessary. Um, before queen c7, I played b3. I thought, okay, I'm, I'm very happy here. The king will be very safe on b2. Uh, and then we will proceed to some kind of quote-unquote technical uh, technical conversion. And then my opponent played uh, rook a8, and I realized the game is only just beginning because I cannot actually stop a7, a5. 
Uh, and here, I think I found a good way to play. I played rook d6, a5, I took on a5, uh, and I played e5, uh, supporting the rook on d6, intending to play knight d4, perhaps. Uh, and uh, after queen a7, which maybe wasn't the best move, I was very happy with my decision here. I played queen d4 first, uh, asked him to play queen a8, of course, black would like to keep uh, this battery on the A file. And then I was very happy with this decision. I played check, g6, and then queen d4 back. And the point of this is uh, for black to actually generate any threats, the bishop, in most cases, will have to go to f5 to create some kind of rook a2, bishop takes c2 threats. But if the bishop leaves the e6 square, we now have the option of playing e5, e6, and then rook d8, and then uh, there will be a mate on h8 which is why it was so useful to provoke black to play g7, g6. So after queen d4, white is, I think, back to being quite safely better. Uh, black played rook a3, I played rook d8, uh, queen a5. Uh, and this is where I made a mistake. I thought I was almost completely winning here. Uh, and I think I lost concentration for, uh, for a second. And I played rook e8, which is a little bit too clever. Uh, it's just... No, normally you shouldn't put pieces on such fancy squares. It was a lot better to place it, let's say, on b8. And after rook e8, uh, b5, b4, I realized that suddenly I gave my opponent a really, really strong threat of queen b5, attacking the rook on e8, and creating a deadly threat of queen f1 check. And... Uh, we were also both, I think, in quite serious time trouble. And I started panicking. I remember I was I was panicking quite hard, but then I realized I do have the move knight of 3d2 here, uh, which protects the f1 square and also obviously creates a very strong threat of knight of knight e4, knight f6. But if my opponent actually still played queen b5 here, I don't know what would have happened to, to my first title. I think we both missed the fact that uh, queen d8, which I think is why he didn't play this move. He thought after queen d8 he gets mated uh, because his queen is no longer on the a file and he doesn't have rook a1 check. Uh, but it turns out that black can just take on e5, protecting the square on h8. Mm. And his mating attack is just much stronger than mine and I have to resign. So after queen b5, I would have to play something like rook d8, queen e2, and king b2. And this becomes absolutely anybody's game. Uh, and it really could have ended in uh, in all three results. But instead, uh, my opponent played queen a6, once again heavily influenced by his time trouble, uh, and he probably missed the fact that I can play knight c4, using the fact, once again, that if he takes on c4, e5, e6 creates uh, unbeatable threats to, uh, to the black king, and white just wins on the spot. Mm -hmm. So he had to play rook a2. You were saying something? No, oh, just uh, agreeing. Yeah, <laughs> and 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 now I played rook b8. He played h5. I take, took on b4. He played bishop f5, and this is I think move 41. And at this point, we both finally uh, finished the time travel, and I could get up from the board. And I saw that the results in the other games meant that if I win, uh, I don't even tie for first. I get clear first. But I still expected him to play something like bishop e6 and the game to continue, even though I am now completely winning because there is no pawn on b4. Uh, I've controlled all the squares I wanted to control, and there's no attack. But I remember it's still kind of embarrassing to me. I went for a walk, as you as you mentioned earlier. Like I, I like walking during games. So I went for a walk, and then I came back to the board, and he resigned uh, right here without even playing bishop e6. And I remember I was so shocked and also so relieved that I don't have to uh, convert this into a full point that I shook his hand and I said, thank you. Mm -hmm. And it's really not something that people, people do. I think it's mm -hmm. very kind of awkward and stupid. Uh, he didn't seem offended. I think he just realized he is, you know, that I'm a, I'm a stupid kid and I don't know what I'm doing. But <laughs> I, I very distinctly remember saying thank you to somebody who just resigned the game to me. <laughs> uh, and yeah, that was, uh, that was the, the tournament victory, uh, which uh, propelled me to, 
gave my career a huge boost because, uh, as I mentioned, they put it in the regulations that whoever wins the tournament and gets invited to play for the first Olympic team. Mm -hmm. So later that year, I played for the Russian national team, which was uh, Kasparov, Kramnik, Vareev, Drev, and I think... No, Rubersky played for the youngster team. It was probably... Yeah, Tivikov. Yeah, it was six people in those years, not five. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I was suddenly uh, playing for the same team as those people you know, who were absolute giants of the game for me, who were basically names I read in, in magazines. Mm -hmm. I haven't really met any of them outside of Kasparov because I was pupil in his school. Mm -hmm. uh, and it really changed my life, the fact that, that I won that tournament. Nice. And, um, well, after that, uh, clearly you, you got invitations, uh, you played abroad quite a lot, and, uh, and then came 1997. And yeah, Gilbert. 97 was, was a, if 94 was my first absolutely stellar year when I had like all kinds of successes, 97 was the, uh, like the real, uh, real br breakout year when, mm -hmm. uh, this is a feeling that I really, really miss because I don't think I genuinely, I probably never felt it again. Mm -hmm. But in 97, b before even showing you any games, and I really should probably speed up because we're taking too much time and there's still a lot, of, a lot of material we might want to talk about. Perhaps we should start showing snippets. But uh, once again, a stupid personal story. Uh, in 97, I, I won pretty much everything I played up to a point. I won, by that point, my third Russian title. Uh, in an absolutely fantastic final uh, against Evgeny Bareev, where we played 10 games and made zero draws. <laughs> uh, it, it was a knockout tournament in which uh, I played 20 games in, gen in, in total, including tie breaks, and I made one draw out of 20. <laughs> uh, I either won my matches 2-0, or they went 1-1, and then I would win the tie breaks 2-0 mm -hmm. somehow, and I made one draw against Vladimir Malakhov. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the final, I lost the first one to Bareev, won the second one, lost the third one, won the fourth one, won the fifth one, lost the sixth one, and then I finally won the, both both of the Blitz games. It was unbelievable. Like, in terms of pressure, it was mm -hmm. one of the most intense things I ever played in my life. Uh, but what I wanted to say was... Uh, the very last tournament I played in 97 was the World Cup in Groningen. Mm -hmm. And in that World Cup, I got, I think, to the last 16, I want to say, maybe the quarters. I think it was the last 16. And I played Mickey, uh, Michael Adams. Unique knows, but perhaps I should be making uh, making myself, <laughs> myself clearer. Mm -hmm. I played Michael Adams, and in, I played a lot of uh, matches against Michael Adams in the history of World Cups, actually. We were playing pretty much every single World Cup uh, for a while. And we made two reasonably quick draws in the classical, and then we started playing rapid. And I beat him with black in the first rapid game. And before the second rapid game started, I kind of considered maybe playing something very safe and playing for a draw, you know, like you're supposed to do and when you only need a draw with the white pieces, right? Mm -hmm. And then I very clearly remember that thought. I thought, how am I going to lose a game? It's just not possible that I will lose a game, right? <laughs> <laughs> and of course I lost the game. And, and then I lost the next one as well. And I couldn't come back again. And that feeling, I think, never really returned. Mm -hmm. I think it was very, very specific to how my 1997 was going. That feeling of, you know, I'm, I'm young. I'm sort of at the top of my game. And whatever I want to happen on the board will happen. Mm -hmm. It's very pleasant to play chess when you feel like that. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I don't remember how. <laughs> <laughs> I, like I, I remember it theoretically, but I don't remember how to get back to that feeling. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it was a, a really miraculous year. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, well, interestingly, since as you've mentioned, we've already spent quite a lot of time on your youth, and which is which was extremely interesting. But still, the, the we've we've started touching this subject perhaps, and it's uh, mm -hmm. it's basically more or less what what I wanted to um, to focus on also in this in this masterclass with you winning so many championships and and uh, being. Um, in the situation where um, high stakes chess is is, uh, is basically a very a very regular thing with the World Cups and all these matches where you have to play on the edge all the time and you've already mentioned that the kind of state of mind you you were in at some point or what you should be in at some point and also in these matches against Pareyev and all the later matches that you've um, gone through. Um, how, how important is it to be um, strong mentally in those um, in those matches or, or in basically um, critical games like at the, the end of a, a Russian championship which uh, you, you badly want to win uh, how is how is it I mean how do you put yourself in a, in a frame of mind which uh, which is positive in order to to achieve the result you're uh, playing for? Yeah, this is this is where I feel particularly awkward because uh, this is the announced theme of the uh, of our conversation, and honestly, like the most, I understand it's not an answer I should be giving, but I I want to start by saying I don't exactly know. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that uh, I managed a few times in my career to to get to that frame of mind where I knew that. Uh, well, not new, but I kind of, I had a very good indication that, uh, you know, the pieces are listening to me, so to speak, that uh, my, my, my mind is clear, my, my calculations are not clouded, I'm not worried too much. I think for me, like if we, if we want to start breaking it down, I think when I wake up before an important game and I somehow discover that I'm not worried at all, this is probably one of the very early uh, signs that it will not go well. Mm -hmm. I generally, I think it's very important for me to be nervous, but sort of the right amount of nervous. There shouldn't be like a full-fledged panic, but if I, if, if it seems to me like it, almost as if I don't care at all, mm -hmm. this normally doesn't go well, well for me uh, either. But... I think the mental side of the game is probably even more important than than the technical one mm -hmm. once you reach a certain level. But it's very, I, I think, you know, books are written on this subject and I I don't think there is a single recipe that works for, uh, for everyone. Mm -hmm. I think for me, uh, uh, sort of a general feeling of well-being, a general feeling of you know, things being all right in my life, things being all right with how I feel about myself was normally very important. But uh, uh, going forward, I think apart from 94 and 97, the best year of my career was 2011, mm -hmm. uh, where I, I won the, uh, the World Cup and I won the Russian Championship with like a round to spare uh, in a tournament which you know, Kramnik played in the tournament and some other very, very strong grandmasters played in that super final and uh, uh, I won it, uh, as I mentioned. I could just not show up for the last round, mm -hmm. uh, which normally doesn't happen in Russian super finals. Mm -hmm. But 2011, in terms of how I felt personally uh, about things happening in my life, was one of the most difficult years of my life. So. Uh, Somehow there is no, I tried more than once to kind of formulate exactly what works for me, exactly what makes me play better. And it's very, very difficult to put into words. I think you, you do need to be confident. You do need to uh, somehow approach this state, maybe not exactly this magical state I was describing it when, when, I, when I talked about 97, when really there were periods when it felt to me like, you know, something absolutely miraculous needs to happen for anybody to win a game of chess against me. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Uh, but you still you, you still need to be confident uh, about what you're doing. You need to be uh, you need to be fresh somehow. Uh, but uh, I I don't have any any specific advice to give. For instance, uh, you, you know I can tell you what people advise to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, in particular in recent years, more and more people mention that uh, specifically working on the mental side of the game, perhaps meditation is something that chess players uh, should be a lot more interested in mm-hmm. uh, because uh, I don't know how well you you know what's happening in, in, in that community, but I think the poker community in particular, the, the, the very, very successful high-stakes community, uh, at some point discovered meditation and uh, I wouldn't say all of them, but many of them are now very seriously trying to incorporate that into into how they prepare because it, it allows them to keep uh, to keep their mind uh, fresh and uncluttered. And reading about it, I feel like it's probably something that would have helped me a great deal at many points in my career. Mm-hmm. But but it's not something I actually tried. Uh, so it feels a little bit stupid for me to say, you know, this is the advice I want to give because it's not something that, you know, I can I can say I, I experienced personally. Uh, I will say that uh, sort of confidence and general uh, general peace with yourself for is is very, very important. But I, I don't know how you achieve that. And uh, that question I've seen uh, I've seen in chat, do top players ever feel like they don't like the game? Uh, is also very relevant. I think uh, staying hungry, uh, staying interested uh, is uh, definitely one of the things that lead to you playing better. Uh, and... Uh, you do occasionally. I, I don't think there was ever a period when I didn't like chess, but there were definitely periods in my life where I felt like I needed a break. I felt like maybe there was a little bit too much chess already this year, and I felt like maybe I need to to get away from the game for maybe a month or two. But I don't think I ever felt like quitting. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. It's, uh, I think from a certain level up, uh, you like tired, yes, but completely falling out of love with chess uh, is not something that you hear about very much, uh, at least when you talk to the people at the, at the very top of the profession. Uh, did I find that the, the higher the stakes, the better my game? Sometimes, but once again, it very much, it very much depends and, uh, uh, another thing that let's say we can uh, I can talk about specifics of my career. I when I started playing for the Russian national team, I think I was a very very good team player. I think my scores for the Russian national team up until maybe the last decade were one of the best outside of the very very top players. Like I'm my my record is not as good as Kasparov's, but uh, it's because probably I'm not as good a chess player as Kasparov is. Uh, but at some point, I found I found that uh, the whole narrative of Russia not winning the Olympiad uh, became uh, so dominant, and this conversation became so, you know, charged every time you know olympiad is every every two years and we haven't won the olympian since an olympiad since 2002 uh we won the one in in bled in 2002 and since 2002 no russian team has won the olympiad Mm -hmm. uh and uh somewhere around 2010 this started becoming a problem uh because we started as favorites pretty much every single time and then we would once again not win. And it would create 
uh, a new talking point uh, and it would, you know, articles would be written about it and uh, former players would give interviews saying probably the team spirit is not present, probably this is, you know, a collection of individuals who don't really care about the team and and you would read all that and you will get upset all over again because it's never true. Uh, and uh, there was never really any problem inside in, in the years at least that I played for, uh, for the Russian national team, there was never really a problem with, uh, you know, our desire to win or the relationship between players and the team. But what I wanted to say is, at some point I realized it's gotten to me to such a degree that I can almost not play normally when I play for Russia. The pressure is just too much. Mm-hmm. And I... I don't think this ever happened to me in individual tournaments. Uh, I can play extremely high stakes games of chess for myself and feel perfectly okay with it. I played World Cup finals. I played, well, you know, in the candidates. I played all kinds of extremely high pressure uh, situations. And I think normally I feel like I can I can collect myself and play almost to the best of my ability in most of those cases. But at some point it turns out that the pressure of playing for the national team actually became overwhelming. And I tried fighting with it, but I never, I never really succeeded. And uh, at some point I just accepted, you know, at some point that they, they no longer started, they selected, started not, not selecting me for the team. And I just thought to myself, I can see why that happened. <laughs> mm. I I can see I can see why why they would think I am not the greatest fit. Uh, so I don't know how happy you are, Yannick, with this direction of my <laughs> of my lecture mm. because I am probably uh, you know describing the negatives a little bit too much, but. Uh, High stakes chess is is a very uh, challenging occupation, and uh, I really don't have any kind of magical answers to it. No, actually, I, I am very happy because you you're going very personal also, and this is, uh, I mean, we need to to I mean, we need we, we try to understand uh, what is going on there, and uh, the fact of, of you saying that perhaps when you're playing for yourself, the pressure is less than. When, when it comes from, from the outside, from media world and, and spectator, perhaps the expectation of spectators in, in Russia, of the Russian fans and, and everything, and especially the lack of, of uh, success of the Russian team in the Olympiad, because it's just an Olympiad thing. I mean, you've been winning a world team championship yeah, we, with we, Russia. Yeah, we European, won other things, yeah, so but the Olympiad is cursed. Yeah, we're just not winning the Olympiad. <laughs> No, it's, it's basically very interesting and um, you're also very modest by saying that you don't really know. But I, I remember talking with Karpov last year when he came to Luxembourg for, for a lecture and I asked him uh, not quite the same question, but basically we were talking about um, a champion being in the zone as, as, as sportsmen uh, usually uh, refer to the the feeling you, you were describing of mm-hmm. yours in, in 97, the, the zone, like you, everything you try just works. And, mm-hmm. uh, and he, he couldn't really also material also concrete, give a concrete answer. So he, he, he gave the example of him winning Linares in, in 94, uh, oh, yeah. crushing the field in Linares, but basically not, not going too deeply into what he had in mind. And you're, you're going really also, I mean, really deeply. And you're, I think you're, 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 your way of describing uh, the thing is, is quite, uh, is is, is very interesting for, for our spectators. Um, but perhaps sometimes, um, so now we've, we've, be, we've been talking about your frame of mind a bit outside the game, but during the game, you're saying you're quite confident and you are um, um, rather uh, calm, uh, despite the nervous, um, the nervous, um, um, yeah, the atmosphere. tension. Uh, yeah. I think I, th- I, th- I think I can I can uh, I, I've learned how to deal with the tension uh, mm-hmm. that uh, that I feel in particular before the game, and uh, normally I've been I've been able to uh, to handle it. And 
if we if we want to to talk about the the chess examples a little mm -hmm. bit, perhaps uh, you know, considering how much time I <laughs> wasted uh, talking about my personal feelings, we can jump jump forward a little bit uh, and. I wanted to show you two two examples. Mm -hmm. uh, as I mentioned, ninety seven was a good year, but perhaps uh, twenty eleven was uh, uh, an even more impressive year in in that uh, in that sense. And I wanted to show you a couple of uh, uh, snippets from from the World Cup I played in uh, in twenty eleven. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is more famous, I think, than the other. But the other one I just wanted to. Uh, specifically show uh, show that game because uh, I was quite happy specifically uh, with how I dealt with uh, with pressure in that game. So I, I wanted to start by showing uh, a game that probably contains my most favorite game, my most favorite single move in my entire career. Uh, the game I played against uh, Gatakamski in the in the last 16 of that uh, 2011 World Cup. Uh, Gata normally always was a very uncomfortable opponent for me. He plays a kind of a brand of chess which I found very difficult to fight. And this is game two of our match, and uh, somewhat surprisingly for me, because I think he knocked out, he knocked me out of at least one World Cup in Hunter Mansisk prior to that, maybe in 07, I want to say, maybe in 09. Uh, and in the first game, I managed to beat him with the white pieces, winning a kind of a game. Uh, which normally he would win against me. A kind of a slow game where I got a nice end game and then I converted that nice game into a full point. And then in game two, uh, uh, this happened. He played e4 and when preparing for this game, I noticed that he doesn't really seem to have a repertoire against specifically the b5 and bishop c5 Spanish, which wasn't in those years part of my main repertoire, but I had some ideas about this position. So I thought, it should be a nice kind of a surprise weapon because uh, Gata really seemed like he didn't really know very much about this line. I think Rostam Kasimjanov played it against him earlier in the tournament and uh, had very good success. Uh, but against me, Gata played something quite principled. He went for sort of the main line, and here he played bishop e3. Of course, the the main line here is knight a3, castle. Whoops, not king of eight, of course, apologies. Castles. Knight takes b5, and here we go, bishop g4, and there is tons and tons of theory. I even at some point recorded video series on this topic, but uh, it's uh, I'm not intending to, you know, plug my videos. I'm just saying that this is not the main line. But bishop b3 is still a reasonably clever move. Black castles, knight bd2, I played h6. Uh, Black would like to play knight g4, but allowing bishop g5 is not great. So you play h6, now knight g4 definitely is a threat. White goes h3. I played rook e8, uh, queen c2, <clears throat> and here, uh, basically, uh, I had a little bit of a blackout. I I thought I was doing very well. I was pretty sure that this way, uh, white cannot really fight for uh, too much of an advantage. And I thought for a little bit, and I thought, okay, I figured out how to equalize on the spot. No problems. Just more or less a forced variation, which leads to me having a very, very uh, comfortable uh, comfortable position. No spoilers. Come on. What are you doing, Omkar? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, I think, once again, it's not really that important what Black is supposed to play here. What we should know is that Black shouldn't play what I played. I took on d4, played knight a5. Uh, of course, if we do pick up the bishop on b3, uh, he, as, as is always the case, in, well, not always, but in most cases in, in the... Uh, Spanish, uh, this bishop is hugely important. So, of course, it goes away. And here I played bishop b7. And I thought, okay, this is just completely fine because uh, the pawn on e4 is now hanging. Uh, if he goes d5, we can take on e3 and then play c6, break everything open, and uh, mass simplifications and a draw, blah, blah. And if he goes e5, <clears throat> we play knight d5, and this bishop is hanging, and also this bishop is hanging as well. So black is completely fine. And then Gata very quickly played e5. I played knight d5. And somewhere around here, I realized what will happen. He will just play bishop b1 here. And we have no good, no good reply to the threat of queen h7 check. And I thought, like, should I just resign? Or what am I supposed to do here? And I thought, no. 
And well, obviously, I'm not resigning because uh, like the position is not lost yet. But also, I at that point the tournament was going well enough for me that I still felt like things are not completely completely hopeless and I should play quickly and I should trust in my ability to calculate uh, my way out of this uh, so I quickly uh, I, I quickly played uh, g6 bishop takes h6 uh, and knight c6 uh, creating uh, some pressure uh, against the pawns on d4 and d5 and surprisingly, this position is maybe not even that much better for white because of uh, those tactical uh, tactical threats that uh, black is developing. But you still have to calculate uh, uh, very uh, very precisely. Um, hang on a second. I just need to deal with something. Um. Um, so my plan here was to uh, try to calculate on his time, basically, to put as much pressure uh, on uh, on him also on the clock, and just hope that that uh, things somehow work out. Because as I mentioned, the tournament was going better for me than most most World Cups would. Uh, and I had once again this this feeling that uh, you know somehow magically things might still work out for me despite me basically blundering Bishop B1 and allowing this kind of a bad position. Uh, he took on D6. I took with the Queen. He played Knight E4. I played Queen B4. Uh, and uh, in this position, once again, there is there's a lot of calculation to be done, but. Uh, the main line is exactly what happened in the game, uh, which is which is what I will show you. We we can discuss uh, all kinds of tactical intricacies here. For instance, there is a move uh, there is a move bishop d2 here, which you need to calculate. I think knight takes knight takes d4 works in the res in response, attacking the the, the queen on c2 and uh, solving our problems tactically this way. But the main move Black needs to calculate here is specifically Bishop A2, attacking the knight on d5, uh, and the knight on d5 is the only thing that stops from uh, from White uh, landing the uh, knight on f6. So Bishop A2, if it works uh, for White, if it works properly, so to speak, will probably just win the game for White. Uh, and here, uh, luckily for me, the move I made is probably the only move I can make. Knight takes d4. Uh, and this is where things get very, very messy. Uh, because on a surface level, uh, the queen is hanging, the knight is hanging. Uh, and if white takes on d4, we take with the queen. We've uh, additionally protected ourselves against knight of six check. This knight is hanging. This is, I think, Quite obviously, an improvement for Black compared to where where we were previously. But there is a move for White in this position, which looks very, very threatening. And that move is Knight of Six check anyway, which is of course uh, tactically justified by the fact that if we take on F6, Queen takes G6 uh, using uh, the pin on this diagonal is just made into. So of course we have to play King H8. But the queen on c2 is still hanging, so white goes knight takes d4. And uh, the rook is hanging, the knight is hanging, so uh, taking on d4 is not very attractive. Therefore, we take on f6. And white played uh, knight c6 here. And I remember I got to this position, and I felt um, that on one level, if we look at this position and then we, we come back to, let's say, uh, somewhere here, it's quite clear that black made some progress because we won back the central pawn, the material is now equal, and uh, the two beautiful bishops we have on b6 and b7 are potentially very active. But unfortunately for us, uh, the rook on b8 is hanging, and 
if we are forced to take on c6, this position is probably quite unpleasant for black because the knight is hanging, the pawn f7 is hanging, uh, and it's not immediately obvious how to solve all of these issues and also coordinate your pieces. Uh, and because of that, I started thinking, what else can I do here? How can I uh, perhaps avoid playing uh, bishop takes c6? And if you start looking at other alternatives, the move that comes to mind first, I think, is queen h4. This is a very logical move, attacking the, the bishop on h6. And uh, if the bishop goes away, uh, black obviously will have a tempo to play something active. I, I'm not entirely sure what. But for instance, if white plays bishop e3, which is probably the best move in the position, trying to uh, defuse the, the very strong uh, bishop on b6, I think the best play for black here is rook takes e3, not even bishop takes e3, but rook takes e3, because I think the bishop on b6 is worth more than a rook in this position. f takes e, and now the second rook comes to e8. And the kind of attack black will develop if he gets to take on e3 with the rook here is probably enough at least for a draw. Uh, and we do have to bring the, 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 the match situation into the conversation here, because having won the first one with the white pieces, I was very happy with the draw in this game, obviously. Draw would have been enough for me to progress to the next stage of the, the World Cup. Uh, but Gato also realized that bishop e3 is not very attractive. And for both of us, the biggest question, of course, was what to do after knight takes b6. Sorry, knight takes b8. And this is... Uh, uh, and this is uh, the position I, I referred to earlier, uh, and the position which uh, I was very I was very touched when uh, the World Chess Federation actually put this position on a postcard, I think last year. Uh, so there is a like a very limited edition postcard uh, with with this on the front side on the front side of it. Uh, which which I felt was a was a very nice gesture by world chess and FIDE in general. Mm -hmm. And if you uh, if you look at this position and you look at Black's options, let's let's list what comes to your mind first. If we take the bishop, the knight comes back to c6, and it's actually not that easy to smoke it out. And the fact that the knight is on c6 kind of blocks our own counterplay uh, on the king's side. So I think white probably will, <clears throat> will be able to stabilize. Then you come to the realization that there is a very beautiful move queen g3 as a kind of a mirror image of that queen takes g6 tactic I showed earlier, using the pin to attack the to attack the, the pawn on g2. And then you realize white can play knight c6 here, and suddenly there is no more attack because once again the knight gets in the way uh, of uh, our own mating threats. And I remember then the absolute thrill of realizing that there is a, an, an additional option here. And I wanted to kind of use this as a puzzle, uh, but it, it has already been mentioned in chat. <laughs> so I think the puzzle is kind of, uh, is kind of invalid now. Uh, there is this move, uh, rook e2 here, uh, which uh, attacks the queen on e2, on c2, and more importantly, distracts the queen from controlling the c6 square. And if I takes on e2, now we play queen g3. And amazingly, there is just no way white can stop queen takes g2 mate because, uh, you know, you can give up as many pieces as you like, but the threat, the threat remains the same, and the threat just cannot be stopped. And I remember very, very distinctly, I played queen h4, and the World Cups in Hante are played in this kind of a theater-type uh, type uh, hall where there is a spectator area, then there is like a barrier, then you see uh, rows of chess boards, and there is also a small uh, like closed off space where you have some refreshments. There is bottles of water there and some tea, and also you can hide there. So I played Queen H4. And I basically ran away from the board because I didn't want to transmit my idea to Gata. And I was hiding there, waiting for him to move. Uh, and how far in advance? I think I saw it 
when I was playing Queen H4. I think not earlier. I'm pretty sure I spotted it when I was thinking about Queen H4 a bit. Um, and I remember very, very distinctly that I was, I was walking there where he couldn't see me, sort of behind, uh, behind the playing area, waiting for him to make a move. And then I saw him take my rook. And when, when, when he captures my piece, it's quite clear which move he made. And I think I ran back to the board. I didn't walk. I actually, I think, ran back to the board to play rookie two. <laughs> I was so happy. <laughs> and uh, knight b8, rookie two, black is just suddenly completely winning. And uh, it took very, very little time for Gata to, to realize what happened. But there's just no defense anymore because not only is, there, is the queen hanging, but also if you play queen c3, which is what he did, after rook takes f2, uh, these two bishops are just completely overpowering. And... Um, you know, nothing can be done about about this mating attack. He played, I think, knight c6, and I decided not to be too fanciful. I think maybe bishop takes c6 is the strongest move in the position, mathematically, quote unquote, mathematically. But I thought if I take on f1, he will just resign, and that's what happened. Because if he takes on f1, of course, he gets mated on f2, and if he goes king h2, I can just take on a1, and I am now a full rook up, and I'm continuing to have mating threats. So. This is probably, I mean, this is definitely the most beautiful single move I ever made on a chessboard. And definitely one of the fondest memories I have about playing chess in, in, in all of my reasonably long career. It's a beautiful move. And it's, it's a bit funny that it, it comes from that moment when you, when you basically, a few moves earlier, you kind of blundered this bishop b1 idea. Yeah. It's... Yeah, it's a it's a it's, it was a weird tournament because it's not as if I played absolutely perfect chess throughout the tournament, but but basically all, all through it, I had this feeling that my mind is still working and things if I if I continue applying applying myself, things things will work out. And uh, I think beating Kamsky in particular was a huge confidence boost for me because as I mentioned uh, Gata in general has been a very very difficult opponent for me and um, when I beat him I thought this might be my year and then I beat Judith in the quarters and uh, Ruslan Ponomaryev in, in the semis also somebody who I lost in the semifinals of that Moscow uh, world championship you mentioned earlier and then I played uh, Grishuk in the finals and uh, by that point, I really felt like uh, it's it's very very possible that I win, and I I did manage to to win. And here, I think we need to take some kind of an executive decision because there are still some things I can show. But mm -hmm. uh, because I talk so much, we're kind of uh, uh, in trouble a little bit. Yeah. So you tell me you tell me how much how much more uh, time we have, and whether you want to have a specific conversation about something and. And then we'll decide how many more chess segments we can show. Well, I'm sure everybody would like to, to hear you for two more hours, uh, Peter. But indeed, the time is, is running a little bit. So perhaps we can, um, I don't know if, if talking about the, two, the 2015 uh, final. Yeah, I think, I think actually, in particular, because I spoke about the negatives al al already, uh, these are all games where I kind of managed to handle the pressure. But... Mm -hmm. Uh, perhaps as a, as a kind of a uh, illustration of what happens uh, when you can't when you when you don't manage to handle the pressure is uh, is perhaps uh, the, the game that uh, that you're referring to mm -hmm. um, that's that one yeah and this uh, I think until this day remains the the most traumatic experience of my entire chess career because uh, if we talk about what I achieved in chess, I think it's it's fair to say that uh, I've done pretty much, well, not everything, but most things apart from winning, well, playing the match for the World Championship. Winning the World Championship is separate, but let's say getting to play a match for the World Championship is something I haven't done. And when in 2015 I, I actually managed to get to the final of the World Cup for the second time, uh, at that time, had I won the World Cup, I would have been the first player to win two. Mm. And that would have been 
an, an absolutely incredible achievement, which uh, uh, I would have been so happy and, and, and so proud about it that uh, it actually drove me slightly insane. And uh, the final started well enough. I, I managed to, to collect myself. I won a reasonably clean game in, in, in game one. And the final is four games, not, not two games as uh, the entire World Cup is. So I won game one, and then in game two, I played some kind of a home-prepared line in the Spanish, and I was fighting for equality the entire game. And then I achieved the quality. And then Sergei blundered a full rook. Uh, in a position where he's not better anymore, but he runs zero risk. He just went completely insane for one, for one move and blundered a full rook. And suddenly, I found myself in a situation where I'm 2-0 up with two games to play, and I need one draw out of the last two games to win the second World Cup of my career. And what I wanted to show you, I don't think we, we need to see the entire game. I wanted to show you a specific moment from game three uh, where uh, I can show you sort of very quickly uh, what happened in the opening. I, I played queen takes d4 because it's supposed to be a reasonably... Uh, safe line to play when you just need the draw. He played a6, which is also very understandable. And we had this kind of a weird Marozzi type position on the board, which I actually had prepared up to a certain point. I uh, One of my friends showed me this line before the game and told me it's very decent. Uh, so I played it. Uh, rook d1, black takes, takes, goes f5, because he needs to play quickly, obviously, in this position. Let's say, if you give me time to play b3, bishop b2, my position will be very safe and also probably just objectively better. So black needs to be quite fast here. So he played f5, I took, he played bishop takes f5. Uh, I played bishop b4. It, it's actually slightly more, slightly more precise to give this check first and then play bishop b4, because it turns out the king is much worse on h8 than it is on g8, but I didn't realize that at the time. Uh, so I played bishop before, he played queen d7, I played knight d5, uh, and we got somewhere here. Uh, and uh, in this position, I was extremely proud of, uh, of the choice I made, because somewhat surprisingly, this is a tricky position for white to play, because black quite clearly is threatening like d4, e5, e4, and he will have a lot of initiative. And if I take on d5, uh, e takes d5, black actually develops a lot of activity, and my knight on b6, which was kind of a useful piece, becomes a little bit stupid. So I think I, I burned like 20 minutes here, and I settled on the move queen c5, which is actually quite strong here, uh, giving Sergei a choice of either playing this endgame, which maybe he is slightly better in, but I think considering that he absolutely needs to win the game, he probably wants to keep the queens on the board. But if he doesn't trade the queens, I think uh, my chances improve a great deal. So he played rook f6, uh, just a kind of a waiting move, not not really doing very much. I played b4, which is uh, useful to support the queen in many lines. Knight e5, cd5, knight d3. I played queen e3. He took on f2. Once again, I'm, I'm showing this sort of without comment because... Uh, it's not really that important uh, what are the absolute best moves in this position. I played rook f1, uh, pinning, uh, pinning, his piece, whoops, pinning his pieces on the f-file. He played queen e4. Somewhat annoyingly, the computer says rook f1 e is the best move in this position, not rook b1. But I played rook b1, and uh, I think I had maybe 20 move minutes at this point, maybe 25, and I spent a large portion of it, calculating specifically the position after rook b1, e takes d5. And uh, if you're an experienced chess player, uh, and I am an experienced chess player, you get the feeling that white should be winning here. Because basically every single piece black has here is hanging. Uh, and there's a lot of very attractive options. The most attractive options here, uh, option here, of course, is the move queen c3. And this was my first idea. Just play queen c3. Now the queen is hanging. Uh, there is a pin, uh, which means that the rook on e8 is hanging. The knight is still hanging on f2. Uh, every single piece black has here is somehow pinned. And then I, I can't remember exactly which move was worrying me more. I realized he has either, either queen f4 or queen f5. 
And let's say queen f5, I take on e8, he takes on h3, and some kind of randomness starts. Or possibly I was worried about queen f4 even more. I can't even remember anymore which one of the two was annoying me more. With sort of the similar idea of rook takes e8, knight takes h3, and then he takes on f1. And my knight on b6 might also hang if I have to take with the, with the queen on h3 and so on. And basically, despite having quite a lot of time in this position, I... I couldn't quite trust myself to calculate it cleanly, so I started asking myself, do I have better options here? Uh, and then I thought, I can just take on f2. And I spotted this move, and I checked it because of how, how many pieces are hanging at the same time here. I think I checked it like five times. And the lines I was checking over and over again were this. If he takes on e3 here, I take. If he takes uh, if he takes here, I will take there. And if he takes on e3, I will take on f6. And he cannot recapture because I now have this very beautiful uh, fork. And I end up with a full extra knight. And of course, if he goes rook e1 check, I can drop the rook back. And I'm uh, once again a full piece up. Uh, and of course, if he takes on f2... I can just take on e4, and then I will take on f2, and once again, I'm a full piece up, and the game ends. And because of how close I was to this absolute triumph of winning the second one, uh, the second uh, World Cup uh, of my career, I honestly, I, I checked and rechecked it countless times. And Sergei is sitting there uh, after eventually I played rook b1, and he was also nearing time travel. So he's sitting there calculating the exact same things. And I'm walking outside of the playing area and waiting for him to play ed. Uh, and when he played ed, by this point, I rechecked my analysis so many times that I no longer really had any doubts that my analysis is correct. And so when I saw that he played this move, I just came to the board and instantly played rook takes f2. And uh, he later told me, we, I mean, we're still on, on, on good terms and we, we, we discussed all this afterwards. And he told me that he indeed has blundered rook takes f2. He didn't see the move was possible. Mm -hmm. uh, but for him, the situation was different than for me because uh, like for him, it's either resign here or find something to do. And miraculously, when he started listing through the moves, the move occurred to him, which I just did not even consider when I was calculating, the move queen e4, h4. And of course, the moment he realized this move is possible, he played it. And I saw this, and it took me about maybe five seconds to realize that something has gone badly wrong, because if I take on e8, he takes on b2, I go, let's say, king h2, and he takes on b6 with the queen. And suddenly we're playing some kind of a heavy piece endgame where I'm a pawn down, and it's not even immediately obvious if I have any counterplay. As it turns out, this is still a draw, but it's a draw specifically if I play uh, rook e7 check, and in this position I'm supposed to play the move rook d7, which I think on, on 10 minutes I probably would not have found anyway. Mm. But basically what happened to me was I just went into a complete meltdown. I... For, for a brief moment, I lost absolutely all ability to, to function as a, as a sentient human being. I was sitting there thinking I was a move away from winning the World Cup, and now I have to calculate again, and I don't know what's happening. Mm -hmm. And I, I sat there trying to kind of calculate, and, and my mind is just going in circles, thinking... Something is going wrong. I don't know what's happening. I like what is happening. Uh, full, full panic mode. And eventually, I thought. I remember I, I found this idea. Of course, I can take on eight. I realized I can take on eight, and the game continues. But I didn't want to do it because I'm clearly worse there, or so it seemed to me. And then I spotted this quote-unquote beautiful idea of playing queen d2, which for now seemingly defends everything. But the problem with queen takes d with queen d2 is that he takes on f2, of course. And I cannot take on f2 because rook takes e1 and there is an, an x-ray and I lose everything. But that was not the plan. The plan was I go queen c3 check here. And then 
when he makes some kind of a move like king of seven, I go queen c7 check, and he can never play rook e7 because we will trade everything on e7, and then in the end I will pick up the rook on f2. And if he goes king f8, I can go knight d7 check, and I probably even win. But I definitely will have a will, will have a perpetual at least in this position. And in my mind, if he goes d5 d4 here, I still go queen c7 check, and everything I just told you is still true, somehow. And then he played d4. And I realized that if I play queen c7 check in this position, he has rook f7, uh, which is a move that completely escaped my uh, my notice. And basically, after queen c3 d4, I can just resign, which is what I did. Mm -hmm. And I will not wish the kind of an evening I spent after that game on my mortal enemy. This much, this much I can tell you. Uh, the, the, the evening and the, the night I spent after this game was one of the most unfun experiences of my entire life. I still could win the, the World Cup by making a draw with Black, but of course that game I lost like an idiot because I really couldn't think straight. And then I somehow managed to refocus for, for the tiebreak, but it just wasn't meant to be. Uh, and... On that topic, I want to say that uh, Sergei's mental game is, uh, I think people always talk about how well he defends and, you know, his technical play and his good opening preparation and his general, you know, chess qualities. But I think to continue fighting when you're zero to down in, in a match of four games in the most important tournament of your life, I guess, because for, for him, it was his first World Cup final. And uh, for him also, it was an absolutely, like, unbelievably important thing that was happening. Uh, I think his mental game deserves uh, amazing amounts of praise because it must be so, so difficult to continue fighting uh, in his spot uh, in that situation. And uh, he showed all of it and more. But yeah, for me, uh, I think that particular game and that, that sequence starting from uh, from here. And just like for clarity's sake, queen c3 wins on the spot because if queen f4, I can take on d5 and black never has any counterplay and I just collect everything. Uh, and if he goes queen f5, I can take on e8 and after knight takes h3. Basically, I needed to calculate one more move. King h2, queen takes f1, and knight takes d5, and once again, black can basically just resign because there is no attack, and I will win, like, all the pieces. Uh, so this is an illustration of what happens even at the very top level when you just fail to control your emotions. And, uh, yeah, there are very, very few things in life that I regret more than I regret that one one blackout that I had in this game. Yeah, well, it, actually, I I don't know if it it will kind of um, soothe your um, your pain, but ba basically, most top players have uh, have had such moments. Uh, I mean, we could we could mention man, many of these. I mean, even Kasparov or or Karpov in, at some points, or Hübner as well. Was, had had terrible moments in in his ways and but but yeah for for sure it's controlling emotions is is kind of the key and um, and I think you you've uh, earlier I think when you when you mentioned the bishop b1 against against uh, Gatakamsky uh, that you kept on fighting like believing in your in your mm -hmm. calculating abilities and and faculties in in general to uh, to, to play chess well, whatever has happened previously, um, basically with the, the the right frame of mind. But here, of course, it of course every situation is very. I just I just couldn't get back to that state. Yeah, yeah. and and, mm -hmm. and that's uh, that's sometimes what happens. You something shakes your confidence so much that you mm -hmm. just you you search for you search for that clarity and that feeling that you are still in control of your mm -hmm. own uh, of your own mind, but 
sometimes it just doesn't come back. And in, in that instance, it, it never came back in that game. And it, it actually never even came back on the next day when I was supposed to play the black game. Because mm -hmm. that game I played like my, my brain was in a fog. Mm -hmm. Like I, I basically recovered some of my senses when my position was completely lost. And it was completely lost by move 12 somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I actually fought quite well and almost, almost saved it, but not quite. Right. Well, uh, Peter, thank you very much for, uh, for addressing this um, painful, actually, moment of, <laughs> of your career and, uh, yeah. and uh, trying to, to um, dissect uh, what went through your mind in these moments, because I, I'm, I'm sure it's very, uh, very instructive to, to people to listen to, to this and, and try to understand perhaps what they should do uh, in, in those moments. Uh, it happened to you at the very top, but it obviously ha can happen to anyone in anybody's game uh, at club level or in junior tournaments, uh, whatever the stage. I would assume so, yeah. And, uh, and for sure it, it, it gives hint insights to, pe to people on what they can do to try and improve. And I think uh, you've mentioned the confidence uh, in, in your own capacities, and this is something you can gain um, mostly by, by working a lot. Um, I remember, um, well, tennis legend uh, Federer saying that, uh, well, he, he, he had to come back from, from a two, two set down match to, to try and win in, in, a, in a Grand Slam. And, and he said that, well, he's, he's done it before. He's gone through that. And, and so he, he knows it's possible. And so, of course, it's a tough situation. He's, he's down. He's close to losing the match. And, uh, but still, he, he made it through and, and came back in the match. And uh, saying that he's gone through that and he's made it was, uh, was essential for him mentally to stay focused, not give up, and, and uh, fight ev on every bowl, I would say, in, in tennis for us. Yeah, it's in uh, and I, I wanted I to wanted just, just tell you that somehow, once again, because I talk so much, we kind of ran out of, uh, like, a that topic never came up, but that was one of the things I actually wanted to say today, that sometimes I get asked uh, why my record in the Russian championships is so good. And I normally actually give this reply, and maybe people occasionally think I'm joking, but I really am not. I think at some point, my successes in the Russian championships were explained by my successes in the Russian championship. Mm -hmm. Because if you, obviously not the first one and probably not the second one either, but if you win, let's say three somehow, and I think I won three basically because I was young and I had a lot of energy and I was at that moment in, uh, in time actually quite good at chess. But at some point, you just feel like you've done this before and you have confidence that you can do it again. And it helps you tremendously. Mm -hmm. It's an unbelievably helpful feeling and uh this is maybe f uh, also an explanation for why i have a, i think a very good record in the world cups uh, because once you start doing well in them when you play the next one and you get to a point where things are not going your way and things are becoming very difficult you still have the memory of you doing well in that precise situation before and that memory kind of keeps you afloat, it keeps you motivated. You, you, you can credibly keep telling yourself that it's possible because you've done it. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, for me, for me, that particular feeling of uh, confidence coming, coming specifically from, you know, concrete experiences has always been incredibly helpful th throughout my career. Great. Uh, Peter, uh, thank you very much for, for all uh, this insight and, uh, and your thoughts on this very important topic that is um, mental strength, um, a frame of mind that we, we need to have in order to perform really well, uh, whatever the level, whatever you do uh, in life. And I, I think it's, it's really helped uh, a lot of um, uh, to hear you on, on this topic and I, I, 
I wanted to keep it, actually we've had great guests also before, but I want to keep it for you because I know how, how clearly you can explain things as well. Uh, Once again, I, I really don't know if I, if I explained is. anything clearly. I'm, I, I, I would like to perhaps apologize because I have a feeling I said I don't know too many times today for, for this to be useful. But you know, it's, a, it's such a difficult topic and also one which is not very um, uh, analyzed by chess players in general. I, if I compare with other sports uh, where mental training is, is a fundamental part of the training Absolutely, itself, yeah. not just hitting a ball, or, but really focusing on, on the mental part. And I think in chess, it's, uh, you've said it before that, that maybe poker players were, uh, were practicing meditation and I don't think many chess players, or at least I don't know them too personally at, at the very top, uh, not enough at least to, to, to know if they practice meditation. But as you tended to say, it's, it's, uh, it's clearly something players don't normally do too often. So it's really a field where, where uh, things can be developed for chess players as well. And, um, well, you know them much better than me, or Kramnik and so on. You've, you've worked as, as a second of, of Kramnik. I don't know if he has practiced any kind of yoga or meditation. Um, not when we were working together, but maybe he has uh, he has started doing it since because I know he was also very interested in in that aspect of of self improvement. Mm -hmm. In any case, many more subjects to uh, to develop for perhaps later masterclasses, which <laughs> we could uh, do with you, Peter. In in any case, it was a, an absolute pleasure to have you uh, here, showing these great examples of yours, explaining those things as as um, clearly as as you know how to, to do it. Uh, Peter, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, thanks for having me. And once again, I, I, I hope I made some sense. I, I never exactly know if I, if I make sense or not. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, I hope I made some sense at least. Well, at, at least people in the chat seem to be, um, to have liked I, it a I, lot. I saw, that, I, I saw that and I'm very grateful, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everybody, for, uh, for uh, your participation, for following this masterclass. Uh, hope to see you uh, for my Monday masterclass, which will be given in German, uh, about Michael Thal. And next Friday, we'll have the pleasure to uh, welcome Maxime Vachilagrave in a masterclass in French this time. And uh, well, uh, have a nice evening, a good night. Uh, Peter, thank you again. All the best to you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for listening.